All right, let's get to our prophecy update. Today's update is one that I will need to kindly ask that you bear with me. I'm going to draw your attention to the developments of prophetic significance, of which there are many. So much is happening so fast, and it's becoming increasingly more difficult to keep up with everything. And just this morning, in fact, I I woke up at 2.30 to update the update, because that's how fast everything is moving, particularly concerning Israel. And so what I sense the Lord would have me to talk about today is what I see as a prophetic window of opportunity, if you will, by virtue of Israel's inability to form a government. Now, I don't know for those of you who have been following the latest developments on this, but I'll begin with this Times of Israel report on Friday about how after four hours of talks between the two parties, Likud and the Blue and White Party, uh, after four hours it ended with no progress, and instead it was just back and forth blaming the other party for the collapse in the negotiations. You have to understand this is unprecedented. Never before in the history of Israel have they had two elections, when a prime minister duly elected was unable to form a government. That's never happened before. Yesterday, the Times of Israel also reported that on Sunday, that's today in Israel, well now it's PM, it's, uh, by the way, it's uh, the new year, Rosh Hashanah uh, is uh, tonight, it starts tonight in Israel. So this morning in Israel, which was last night for us, they resumed talks. And it was reported that if those talks, which took place this morning, failed, that Netanyahu would likely return the mandate that he was given back to Israel's president, Reuben Rivlin. Just this morning, Arut Sheva reported that Today's negotiations ended in yet another deadlock. Now, we are in uncharted territory. Uh, All eyes are on what happens next. There is some talk about a third election, which nobody wants. There's also this discussion about a joint leadership as prime minister, between Gantz and Netanyahu. But (laughs) it's important to understand that there are those in Israel that not only don't want Netanyahu re-elected, they want him indicted. Just as there are those here in the United States that want to see President Trump impeached. Don't you find that kind of interesting? maybe just a little bit. On the heels of Israel's second election and the prospects of an unprecedented third, the UN General Assembly took place last week in New York, and it was, ah, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, for lack of a better word, It was interesting. Present at the UN was none other than Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, who according to Sky News was quoted as saying that his country's message to the world is peace and stability. Speaking from New York, where he was attending the UN General Assembly, Hassan Rouhani added, quote, we want to tell the world that the situation in the Persian Gulf is very sensitive. Oh, that's, that's an understatement. That's an understatement of all understatements. 
Well, that was on Monday, the day before Hurriyet Daily News published a report about Turkey's President Erdogan saying that he would address international peace and security issues at the UN General Assembly on the first day of the general debate on September 24th. By the way, Netanyahu, because of the week prior election results, uh, was not at the uh, United Nations General Assembly this year. That's uh, a first as well. I suppose it should come as no surprise that Iran, Turkey and Russia are now seemingly emboldened in the wake of not only the political division in Israel, but also what's happening here in the United States. Is it just me or are there, I'm going to use the word powers and principalities in the spiritual realm that are literally hell-bent, I don't say that as hyperbole, that are doing everything they can to destroy Israel and the United States. And are we surprised? You have to understand that Iran considers the United States to be the great Satan and Israel to be the little Satan. Now, how are you going to destroy Israel? You have to get rid of America first. And what is the textbook way that the enemy destroys? It's textbook. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Look at the division. I mean, I, maybe it is just me, but I have, you know, I have these TVs in my office. They're on mute, more so now than they have in the past been on mute. Every once in a while I'll unmute them to hear what they're saying. And I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the news coverage and I'm saying to myself, they want to impeach President Trump. And they want to indict Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, that sounds to me like exactly what we're told will happen at the time of the end in Bible prophecy. What do you mean? Well, let me explain how I get there. In Ezekiel 38, we're told that Russia, Iran and Turkey will be at the helm of an alliance of nations that will invade Israel from the north vis-a-vis -vis Syria, there in the Golan, to take a spoil. It's a very detailed prophecy in Ezekiel 38 and conspicuously absent from this prophecy is any mention of any nation, chief of which is the United States of America, coming to Israel's defense. You know what that means? That means that something has to happen to the once most powerful nation in the world with a pro-Israel president like we've never had before prior to this Ezekiel 38 prophecy being fulfilled. There's another very interesting detail in that prophecy. And it's in verse 13, where we're told that by their ancient name, Sheba and Dedan, Saudi Arabia, along with Tarshish and the young lions thereof, will merely protest, question this invasion of Israel by Russia, Turkey and Iran and this other alliance of nations. Well, isn't that interesting? Because if I'm not mistaken, uh, Iran has been uh, launching strikes against the oil uh, facilities that Saudi Arabia has. That's interesting. 
And even more interesting is the threats that continue to come from Iran. They just had another summit too, by the way. Did you know this? Iran, Russia, and Turkey. I think it was the fifth one they've had in Syria, (laughs) without Syria. I mean, it was about Syria without Syria. Let me say that again, because it's jet lag. I'm going to use jet lag. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. (laughs) They had another summit, the fifth summit. This is Russia, Iran, Turkey, Erdogan, Rouhani, and Putin. And it's about Syria without Syria. Bashar al-Assad is nowhere to be found. And it was very interesting, this last summit. You can find it on YouTube with the closed captions uh, in, in the translation. Putin actually quotes from the Qur'an. He quotes from the Qur'an in his defense of this alliance that they have together, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Well, breaking Israel news on Monday had a report in which they quote the representative of Iran's Ayatollah Khamenei as saying that Iran has the ability to turn Israel into dust in, quote, half a day. I can't help but notice the irony in all of this, because according to the Ezekiel 38 prophecy, it's the Russia, Turkey and Iran alliance that will be turned into dust within what some believe will be less than one day. It's going to be very decisive, very swift. And it will be God. And this again is another detail in that prophecy that we see beginning to come to pass. But no nation is there. The only reason that this alliance of nations is dealt a decisive and decimating blow is because God intervenes. And He says, I'm going to do this so that they will know that I am God. I alone will get all the glory for intervening on behalf of my people Israel. Have you, have you seen a map of the Middle East lately? I mean, it needs to be a big map or else you cannot even fit the name Israel on the sliver of land. They have to put it off on into the Mediterranean. Israel with an arrow pointing to this little sliver of land. And then here's Russia, here's Iran, here's Turkey, et al, all of these nations. And they're going to invade Israel and be defeated within a 24 hour period or less, I believe personally. How is that possible? Oh, <laughs> I, I could just imagine God saying, hello. I did it. I am God. You know, throughout the Old Testament, it's replete where God declares, I am the Lord your God. The emphasis being on I. They're not your God. That's not your God. You're not your God. I am the Lord your God. On Wednesday, CBN News published an article written by Ray Bentley. I've had the privilege of meeting and getting to know Pastor Ray Bentley. He's the pastor of Maranatha Chapel in San Diego. That's where my son goes to church, thankfully. Listen to what he had to say about this attack on the Saudi oil fields. Iran and Saudi Arabia have been at odds for quite some time, but This latest saga in the ever-growing tension between the two has led me again to the passages of Ezekiel chapters 37, 38, and 39. 
there we find a 2,500 year old prophecy that's quite specific. Ezekiel tells us that there will be coming a war. On one side of that war is Persia. Students of history will remember that Persia is the ancient name for the land now occupied by modern day Iran. On the other side of that conflict where God Himself will intervene is what is referred to as Sheba and Dedan, which is now ruled by, you guessed it, Saudi Arabia. Listen, I, ah, how do I say this? I'll just say it. I know, what a novel idea. I'll just say it. If this isn't Ezekiel 38, I don't know what is. If this isn't the beginning of the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38, I don't know what is. But God, but God. God is having the final word in the Middle East, particularly in Iran. What if I told you that the greatest revival that is taking place in the world today, and I've shared this before, and I'm, I'm really excited to share this with you again today. What if I told you that more Muslims in Iran are coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ than at anywhere else in the world, in Iran. But you'll, you'll, you'll never hear about it. <laughs> but it's happening. So Fox News has this article about Iran now having the world's fastest growing church. And it's about this new film that tells the story of how in the world, this church, these believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ in Iran, are underground and persecuted. And this movement is in a country known for exporting radical Islamic terrorism in Iran. People in Iran, a Muslim majority nation, are fleeing Islam in droves as believers bow their knee to Jesus and become aggressively pro-Israel. It's happening in Iran as we speak. You know what struck me about this article, and there was a couple of different news agencies that covered this, but what really struck me was the prominent and pronounced role of prayer in winning these Muslims in Iran to Christ. They pray about who they're to talk to about Jesus, share with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's always birthed out of prayer. I'm going somewhere with this, and I bet you don't know where I'm going. I bet you actually do. I want to talk about our prayer meeting Tuesday night. And I want to share with you that at our last prayer meeting, we had one of the most powerful, probably the most powerful prayer meeting we've ever had as a church together. And we uploaded the first 30 minutes. It was actually, it went for an hour and a half. Nobody wanted to leave. I love it when that happens. But the first half hour we actually uploaded to YouTube for the benefit of our online church, many of whom have asked us to pray for them about some very intense things. And I want to share with you a praise report, because at that prayer meeting and since that prayer meeting, I've been asking God for praise reports to come in. In other words, what God did because we prayed. I want to share with you a bona fide miracle that took place as a result of our prayer meeting. 
A few weeks ago, I sent in a prayer request for a high school student in critical condition after a rollover accident while driving his truck. According to an x-ray, his spinal cord was severed, as well as other injuries to his brain, aorta, and collarbone. Shortly after the prayer meeting at your church, the doctors decided to do surgery on his spine to repair what they could, but told the parents that he would never walk again. To their amazement, the spine turned out to be completely whole. This miracle has spread throughout our community and across state lines, and God is getting all the glory. After three weeks, he's still in the hospital, but is gradually healing from all his injuries. This young man comes from a Christian home and loves the Lord. God bless you and your church body for sharing our burden to pray for Ethan. He's a very close friend of our granddaughters, and this miracle has impacted her life also. Thank you. Thank you for clapping. All the glory goes to the Lord. I'm holding in my hand one, two, three, four pages. It makes me want to cry of people's prayer requests. They have sent these prayers into us, asking us to pray for them. It's two sided. So that's eight pages of prayer requests from people pleading with us to pray for them. You know what kind of stuff's on here? Husband comes home, 35 years of marriage, wants nothing to do. He's gone. 35 years of marriage. Stage four cancer, stage three cancer, weeks to live. My daughter's identified as LGBT. My daughter's cutting herself. My son just killed himself. And the list goes on and on and on. Drug addiction, mental illness, mental illness. I don't know what to do. Please, will you pray? If not us, who? If not here, where? If not now, when? (laughs) Don't you want to be a part? of what God is doing and is able to do. I'm sorry for raising my voice. No, I'm not. I'm actually not. (laughs) I hope you'll come on Tuesday night. You know, it seems like the last year or so, been a heavy emphasis on the need for prayer. You know how many, by the way, so we have our prayer meeting on Sunday mornings before this service from uh, 7.45 to 8.15, half hour. And I, I lost count, but there were numerous requests from people praying specifically, asking us to pray specifically by name for people's salvation. I mean, they list them, pray for their salvation, and they list the names. What a privilege it is to pray for these people. I want to bring it to a close with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation found in the person of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? The gospel, Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, is basically this, that Jesus came, that he was crucified, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, and he's coming back again one day. That's the gospel, the good news. Why is that good news? Because He came to die for you and me. 
He came to pay in full for you and me and for all of our sins so that he could offer us the free gift of eternal life. That's why we do the ABCs of salvation. It's a simple childlike explanation of salvation. The A is for admit or acknowledge that you sinned and that you need the Savior. This is what it means to repent. It's a change of mind, an about face, a 180, if you will, where you turn from your sin and you turn to the Savior for forgiveness of sin. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were all born sinners, which is why we must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. We've all been sentenced to death eternally because of our sin, because all sinned. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the A. Here's the B. The B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God raised Him from the dead. That's what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And the C, the C is for call upon the name of the Lord, or as Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And lastly, Romans 10, 13, this is what seals the deal. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's that simple. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad it's not complicated? Aren't you glad that it's childlike simple? When shall all stand, we'll pray. Father in heaven, we see what's taking place in the world today and in our own country today. And in particular, what's happening in Israel today. And as we connect the dots with what we see in Scripture, it's becoming abundantly clear that it's coming to pass exactly as you said it would. You told us what was going to happen before it happened, so that when we would begin to see it happen, non-believers would believe and believers would look up and lift up their heads, knowing that their redemption draws nigh. Lord, I want to ask you for anyone that might be in this church or watching online that has never called upon you, believing in you, putting their trust in you for the forgiveness of sins, that today would be the day of their salvation, while there's still time, before it's too late. Lord, thank you. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.